Good evening. Uh, welcome to yet another weekly forum from uh, Smart Karma. And, um, you know, just as we normally do in each of the weekly forums, I'm going to give uh, participants maybe sort of 15, 20 seconds to dial in. And while, while everyone is streaming in, I'll sort of very briefly go over the disclaimer and a quick recap of some of the ideas we discussed in previous sessions. So first of all, uh, the forum is strictly for subscribers. It's purely for informational purposes. It does not uh, constitute investment advice. It's the opinion not of Smart Karma, but that of our insight providers. And uh, lastly, but quite importantly, Chatham House rules apply. So please do not share any of the information discussed on social media or any public forums without sort of prior express permission. With that, let's start uh, by taking a look at some of the things we discussed in previous sessions. So <clears throat> last week, which was the week of the 25th, uh, we first took a look at Ultra Jaya, which is the most dominant uh, dairy company in Indonesia. It has a 40% market share in milk, 70% market share in ready to drink uh, market. And it trades at a third of the valuation of regional peers. Quite an interesting idea. We had Angus dial in from Bali to actually present this. Second, we took a look at Thai Bev's beer PO. We looked at you know, uh, whether this will really unlock any value or not. For this, we had Devi Subhasekhan join us. She's based here in Singapore and covers consumer names in the region. And lastly, we took a look at Japan's dying department stores where sales have gone back to the 1975 levels. And we also briefly discussed a, a hidden gem called OEC uh, Radaichi 318 to Japan, which is, which is growing eight to 10 X year on year, um, remains a very hidden, but a very exciting company. The, the week before we took a look at Pacific Textiles which is, um, which is a name that could potentially get taken out, acquired this year and has a lot of hidden Hong Kong exposure. We discussed the opening of Macau and you know, just a few days after this, actually Macau opened up to Chinese tourism and you know, the stocks have started to do well. We also explored pet care as a theme. <coughs> Excuse me. So like this every week, we tend to look at typically a dominant small or mid cap, a large cap, and then a thematic. So this week, we've got three ideas for you. <clears throat> First, we are uh, looking at a Singapore listed REIT and a special situation there. Um, second, we're going to look at a mega cap, Tencent, a very, very well-known and well-owned stock. And third, we're going to talk about a brutal sell-off in global tech it's something, you know, we've been discussing rising inflation, rising yields for quite a while now. And we're going to talk about what next a little bit, a little bit today as the thematic topic. So with that in mind, I'm going to start with the first one. Just a quick reminder that uh, you can ask me questions at any given point of time. You can use the Q&A button on your Zoom applications. You can use the chat. Um, if you want, you can also raise the hand using Zoom and I can even let you speak on the forum. We like to keep these quite interactive and two-way. Uh, but if, you, if, you, if you're shy and you don't feel like asking questions today, that's fine too. I know some of you reach out to analysts post discussions on the platform anyway, so that's great. <clears throat> so let's kick things off. So the REIT that we want to talk about is called Cromwell. Uh, this is uh, Singapore listed. Uh, but it's largely a European REIT. That's why it's actually denominated in euros. It's got Europe, European in its title. Um, it's about one and a half billion US dollar market cap. So not too shabby. It trades about a million dollars uh, a day uh, with a dividend yield of 8% plus. Now we speak of a special situation here and, and let's drill into this. So first of all, um, being a, being a REIT that has European assets and listed in Singapore, it's a little bit orphaned. You know, the, the typical Singapore-based investors tend to focus on REITs that have Singapore assets. 
and cross-border uh, rates often get missed. So this is, this is definitely a name that's very under-owned because it's got European assets while listed in Singapore. However, amongst cross-border REITs, it's actually the most diversified. They have 103 properties across seven countries. Uh, interestingly, the CEO of this company, he was actually based in Asia for a very long time. His name is Simon Gehring. He used to be a research analyst at UBS, and then he spent quite a lot of time at Merrill as well. Whenever we speak to anyone in the industry, they've got like really good things to say about Simon. In fact, in January, we organized a webinar with, um, with Simon. Uh, this is on the platform. So if I just type Cromwell, let's type. Okay, Cromwell European REIT. Um, look, we had a corporate webinar um, here on the 12th of January. And actually, every time we do a webinar, we post a recording um, on the platform as well. So for those of you who want to go and see what Simon spoke about or how clear or eloquent he is, you should definitely see this recording. Um, so, you know, in Jan, Simon was talking to us a lot about how last year, 2020, was really not as bad as people feared uh, to be for them. Um, you know, they in fact saw about 2% increase in the rentals, so 2% rental reversion, uh, you know, their properties were very well occupied, 95% plus occupancy. The dividend per unit was only down about 3%. So that was really quite a decent performance. Uh, you know, this, this company uh, has exposure to office properties. It also has exposure to logistics. And, you know, I think the logistics assets tend to tend, uh, did quite well, balanced out maybe some of the weakness in office. Now, so for a month or so after this webinar, um, the company placed $94 million worth of stock. So they, they did a placement in the, uh, you know, it's a private placement. It was organized by City, DBS, and UBS. Um, this placement was done for two purposes, and this is where the special situation comes in. So it was done to complete the acquisition of a few assets. The, this acquisition had been announced several months ago, and the deal was going to close on the 31st of March. So to fund this acquisition, they wanted to place some stock and raise money. Also, this is a very peculiar number, 94 million. It was structured to increase the free float of the company. You know, it, was, it increases the market cap uh, of the company. It increases the free float. And by doing that, Cromwell European REIT is now eligible to be included in the FTSE EPRA NA REIT Developed Asia Index. It's a real mouthful. But basically, this is the major index that tracks global REITs. And companies that get included in this index uh, tend to get a lot of passive flow from ETFs and other passive funds. And it tends to cause a big re-rate for, uh, for the REITs that get included. So with this placement having concluded on the 24th, Cromwell now is eligible. And I think the chart on the right just, just shows you, um, you know, the, what the eligibility criteria is and how the placement got them right over that eligibility criteria. Now, what's interesting is, <clears throat> This placement was done at 43 cents. Uh, the day before the placement was announced, the stock price was actually 50 cents. Right now, if I go and take a look at the share price, it actually, you can see it here, it's 44 cents. So it's just one cent above the private placement price. Now that's really, really good levels actually, because the book was very well covered. It was about twice covered. Um, I think there were some comments about it as well. The placement was more than two times oversubscribed. So in these weak markets, as, people, as the sort of stock is settling down, you're actually getting the price or close to the price that was offered to you know, big institutional investors in this private placement. And going forward now, uh, Cromwell becomes eligible for inclusion into this, this uh, index, which should cause a re -write. Meanwhile, 
if I look at the dividend that they announced last year, based on those numbers, this is trading on an 8% dividend yield. Now, this is interesting and important, you know, because this is 8% yield on European assets. You know, if this was 8% yield on Indonesian assets, that's fine, you know, nothing big to shout home about. But in Europe, you've got negative rates. And, you know, most real estate assets are trading on, you know, 1%, 2%, 3% type yields. So you've got a European asset here, which is giving you 8%, is about to get included into a global index. And also logistics, you know, a lot of it is tied to e-commerce. Logistics as a percentage of their total asset base is now close to 40%. So I think fundamentals have improved. The technically, the inclusion is a great thing for them. You're getting good price levels. You're getting great dividend yield, a lot higher than similar companies that are listed in Europe. So I think, I think that's what makes the special situation in Cromwell European. I would recommend reading insights on the platform. There's quite a few. Angus wrote on it, Ginger wrote on it, and we've sort of covered it for a while. Uh, I, think, uh, I think liquidity is set to improve in it as well as the free float has gone up. So I think this would be quite an interesting name to follow. And with, uh, you know, with yields having <coughs> sold off in the last month or so, you know, th this, this will again be a name that people will pay attention to. So slow and steady, like most of the reads, but with a great sort of risk reward profile. I'm gonna just pause here very, very momentarily in case you have any questions on Cromwell, uh, but you can sort of ask me later as well. If not, I'm just gonna move on to the next idea. Okay, cool, let's keep going. So, um, you know, the second idea that we're featuring today is um, a $112 billion market cap company. It trades $2 billion per day. Um, the stock's been on an absolute tear, um, but there, there, are, there is one particular risk that nobody seems to be talking about, and it's not a very small risk, and that's that's the focus of um, today's uh, discussion. So first things first, right? The next Tencent is still Tencent. What do we mean by that? We mean that Tencent is a very unique company that is very strategically positioned, and it's 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 always been sort of a well liked stock on the platform, and and we're we're in no way negative on the company as a whole over a long period of time. However, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a specific risk that is not reflected in the price, and we want to talk about that. So if you rewind back three years and go back to 22nd March 2018, on that day, NASPERS, who is a, a NASPERS is a South African conglomerate and is also the largest shareholder of Tencent they announced a placement where they sold down $10 billion worth of Tencent. Mind you, this was just 2% of their holding. Uh, and that alone was worth $10 billion. Now, when they did that sale, they also agreed to a three-year lockup period. So for the next three years, which end on 22nd March, 2021, they could not sell down any more Now, if you, if you look at this chart, you know, this was when, um, you know, March 2018, when they sold down. And then for a very long period of time, you know, almost May 2020, uh, you know, or rather April 2020. So for about two years, the stock just could not perform. It stayed below the levels where NASPERS had sold it. That's quite important. So, and then of course, you know, um, later part of 2020, uh, you know, COVID benefited Tencent and Tencent rallied very, very hard and almost doubled, um, which, was, which was great. Now, as it stands, Tencent is trading 87% higher than the price at which NASPERS last sold. Terrific, right? Now, NASPERS actually needs to sell down even more than they did three years ago. Why? So for this, you have to look at why, why did NASPERS sell three years ago? The reason they sold was because 
they wanted to raise cash to reduce the discount to fair value for NASPERS. So NASPERS, as I mentioned, is a conglomerate. They hold shares in a company called Process, and then Process holds shares in Tencent. So it's like three steps. They wanted to raise this money to buy back shares in Process and reduce this discount. However, what's happened is that actually the discount has widened even more. Meanwhile, the rest of NASPERS portfolio outside of Tencent is actually doing even better than Tencent. So I think the reason to sell Tencent is now stronger than what it was three years ago. Meanwhile, you know, you'll remember from our discussion on Alibaba, there's a lot of regulatory risk around internet companies in China, especially those involved in payments and Tencent is one of them. So that risk is, is not being reflected in the share price either. So I think this is the angle. And again, you know, if we go back and look at this insight from Sumit Singh, um, let me just open it. I think it's very, very helpful to put things into context. So, you know, this was the chart you just saw. This is the structure, NASPERS owns process, Process owns some a lot of e-commerce companies, and they also have uh, investments in Tencent and Mail.ru. So this part is doing really well. So if they need to raise a bit of money, they should be selling this down. Meanwhile, this is the relative performance. So you know, Process market cap has increased by 61%. Naspers has increased by 54%, but Tencent has increased by 122%. So actually. You know, the dreaded hold code discount has actually increased. This is why there's even more reason for people to sell down uh, or rather for NASPERS to sell down the holding now. Now, what are the risks to this uh, uh, particular thesis? Um, you know, there's a few things. First is, you know, Tencent will have its results on the 24th of March. If there is a sell down, it can only happen after the 24th, which is important. Um, second is, you know, process could do what SoftBank recently did, i.e., you know, enter into a bunch of derivative contracts, which, are, you know, where they basically get money from investment banks against their holding without actually selling down the shares of Tencent. But either which way, you know, I think I think the market will notice the fact that NASPERS is, is looking to sell down, whether they do it directly or via a derivative contract. So I think this is the idea. It's very, very mean variant. You can imagine a lot of banks are trying to get some sort of role in this placement and hence they're not going to necessarily highlight the negatives here. Also, you know, since the 21st, which is when, uh, you know, Sumit wrote on it, um, the shares have started to underperform. So let's take a very quick look at how shares are doing. So you can see, you know, uh, this is sort of where Sumit wrote and it's starting to kind of weaken a little bit, but keep an eye on this. It's a huge outperformer, very well owned, very well liked. Uh, so it can come under some pressure here. Okay, again, questions at any time are welcome. Otherwise, I'll just keep moving on. Okay, uh, now we're on to the third and final uh, topic of discussion for today, which is you know the great rotation and sort of looking sort of a little bit more carefully. So over the last you know few weeks, we've seen a brutal sell-off in global tech. You know, it's it might not be as brutal when you look at the sort of top line Nasdaq index performance, but at a single stock level, it's been pretty bad. You know, 20, 30% moves are quite common and still the stocks are very, very expensive. I know, you know, funds like ARK Investments and Cathy Woods have been, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how well they've done, but I think it's worth seeing what's happening to the performance of the top 10 holdings of Cathy Woods portfolio of ARK Invest. Uh, maybe we can sort of quickly see it here. If I type ARC, let's see. I might be able to find it. Okay, so this was, um, let's see. 
not so clear here. Look, this is the, you know, how these things have really starting to come under pressure. And, you know, when funds do really, really well, but then you have these periods of brutal sell-offs, um, unfortunately, some of these things can lead to uh, big unwinds and redemption. So, be, you know, we've been cautious on tech anyway, and it's starting to sort of accelerate on the downside. Uh, but at the same time, you know, global markets have been flat or even going up while tech has been underperforming. So there's really a rotation happening. People are switching into other areas. And, you know, this is, um, this is something that's talked about on the platform a lot. So, for example, I'll draw your attention to this third chart here, which shows S&P 500 growth versus value. So tech is basically a lot of growth. And if you look at, you know, for pretty much all of 2020, growth outperformed value. And then, you know, that since December has, has changed uh, big time. Also, small and mid caps have started to do quite well. They've broken out of their slumber versus the large caps. You know, so there's been a real shift in what in the market is delivering performance. Now, all of this is tied to the discussion about inflation interest rates moving up, and also banks starting to do well and commodities starting to do well. So it's all sort of intertwined. So, you know, whoever was listening to us, I guess, since August talking about how financials is the place to be, how under-owned financials are, and how over-owned tech are, you know, they are, you know, they're, they're starting to sort of make sense of this. Now what's going to happen is important and interesting. You know, we think global leadership has definitely moved away from tech. And I'll show you a very simple way to look at this. Um, you'll be surprised. I mean, before I show you the chart, um, you know, have a rough guess in your own heads of when did Amazon make new highs last? A lot of people think it's, it's been moving high all this time, right? It's Amazon, it's doing so well, it's e-commerce and so forth. But take a look at what the market is saying. So if I go back one year here, look at this. Amazon peaked on the 1st of September, 2020. You know, so all of September, October, November, December, Jan, Feb, six months now. Amazon's been underperforming for six months. You know, if I look at uh, Facebook, let's do, let's, let's do the same very simplistic analysis here quickly. Guess what? It peaked on the 1st of September as well. It's uncanny. If I look at, you know, Alphabet, Google, Maybe it's done a little bit better, but let's see. Yeah, this one's a bit of an exception. Um, let's look at Netflix. Again, you know, July, August levels, we, we just can't seem to get past them, right? Um, of course, some of the more direct beneficiaries of COVID, names like Zoom, which were very popular stocks early part of 2020. When did Zoom peak? There you go, October, you know, one month after Amazon. So it's, you know, Mr. Market can often be smarter than we think um, it is. And, you know, the market here peaked well, about six months ago for tech stocks. Meanwhile, if we see what, what has the S&P done? Uh, so the S&P 500, if I look at one year, has actually continued to go up. So if you're holding some of these tech names, big tech names, you're actually underperforming the market. There's been a real rotation. Now let's look at what people have rotated into. So let's look at JP Morgan, for example. I know we, we spoke about um, JP, um, one second, I'm oh, sorry, here. One year chart, look at that. <laughs> Very visible, right? Uh, if we look at oil companies, let's just look at Exxon, just 
I'm just looking at proxies here. I'm not sort of just big, big, big proxies. Exxon, one year, bang, right? And look, that's October, right? That's when tech peaked and these sectors have taken off. Um, so, so this is, you know, we think this is gonna continue, right? It's all about energy and financials. Now within commodities, metals look really, really stretched. Um, you know, I, I received a message from one of our subscribers about 30 minutes before the forum started, and he was talking about the giant drop in nickel price today. Um, you know, it's, it's just really fallen off a cliff today. So a lot of these metals, which are reliant on Chinese policy, they too are struggling now because China is not really easing any further. Uh, where the focus now is financials, energy, as well as recovery and reopening trades. Uh, you know, we, and also if you think about it, ASEAN markets as well, because they've really lagged. They will be the last ones to recover, right? China was the first one. Then we saw the US pick up, we saw Japan pick up, we saw, you know, and then one by one, we saw India pick up. And now the last markets are, are ASEAN, which is why a number of the ideas that are getting featured and discussed over the last few weeks are now looking at some of these markets where there are still great recovery trades to play. Lastly, this is important and kind of a bit sad, uh, but you know, nonetheless, strong economies do not result in strong stock market performance. You know, we've often spoken about how the best time to invest is when the economies look bad and, and, and you know, the stocks lead that recovery in economies. This year, we're gonna probably see the strongest GDP growth that we've seen at least in the last two decades. And that means the central bankers cannot ease, stimulus has to pause, you know, yields have to go up, inflation picks up, and a lot of these things, they crowd out the asset market. So, you know, I think my favorite phrase in January was the sizzle will fizzle. And we're just starting to see that in fact, it's the first month and People are running very, very high margins in their portfolios. They're very heavily levered. I think, um, I think that's extremely risky. I think it's time to be smart, cautious, avoid crowds, you know, uh, while, while COVID might get over post-vaccination, you know, the crowds in the markets are, are equally dangerous. So that's the bigger thesis. You know, if you want to read up on it, I would, I would suggest you read Cam Hui's work so Cam is a, you know, he's a, let me just briefly show you his profile. So Cam's based in Canada and he uh, is a cross asset strategist and quantitative analyst. So he looks at how, uh, you know, asset, ice, asset prices and different markets are going to uh, do over time. And I think, uh, you know, I think that that makes for a very, very interesting read. And we featured his insight today, which is here, which talks about the rotation. Let's open it briefly. Just flick through it. So this is these were the charts that you saw. You know, he's he he has a very very cool way of looking at how things are rotating, which things are doing well, and which are falling out of favor. So you can see Nasdaq is sort of, you know, falling out of favor, right? You know, the right, you want to own assets that are in the top right hand side. So EM, X China, Japan, Euro stocks, even UK are starting to come here. Um, you know, what's been weakening and lagging NASDAQ, maybe a bit of S&P uh, and so forth. Um, there are many other really, really interesting charts in here. You know, again, energy, financials, industrials, they all went from lagging to improving and into leading. You know, materials and consumer discretion were the first guys, they're starting to fall out, tech, healthcare, staples, they're definitely out. Um, so this sort of, you know, we, as I'm, I've mentioned before, we look at positioning, we look at strategy uh, very closely. I think the other analysts in this space who's really, really good and well-followed globally. His name is Michael Howell. We've spoken about him before here. He writes on liquidity. He's got a PhD in liquidity and he's a cross-asset liquidity strategist on our platform. So, you know, I think we spoke about it in January, right? Um, 
strong economies will crowd out the asset markets. And that's sort of unfortunately exactly what is starting to happen now. Uh, and with that, you know, we're going to wrap up on today's forum and just sort of, ah, last questions. Um, okay, I've got a question. Between First Street and Cromwell Reed, both of which you featured, which would you choose? Um, well, I, I look, I mean, it, it really depends on your portfolio. It's very, very different exposure. First Street is exposure to hospitals in Indonesia, and you're, you're exposed to the Indonesian rupiah, you know, which can be volatile, uh, much more volatile than, you know, maybe the euro. Cromwell gives you exposure to developed markets, Europe at 8%. So you're getting emerging market yield at about 11% with First Street. But, you know, First Street is part of the Lipo group and they are, you know, they've got a bit of a checkered past on, on the governance scorecard. Cromwell has a very strong sponsor, which is Cromwell Australia. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, if I had to, if I had to put personal money, this is just for me personally, I, and I had to kind of allocate between the two. If I had hundred dollars, I'd probably go 70 Cromwell 30 first, just in terms of sort of risk versus reward in both of these. That's how, how, how I would look at these. Hopefully that answers the question, but you know, again, nothing that's discussed on this is targeted, you know, advice to anybody. It's, it's sort of a general discussion and you've got to look at things from your own personal perspective and, you know, how you are positioned and your portfolio is to put it into context. Okay. Okay, um, I've got another question here. Cromwell is obviously exposed to European FX risk. Yup. What is the view of Euro USD medium term? So <clears throat> we've got a, you know, we've got a great uh, FX analyst on the platform. His name is uh, Gotham Jane. He tends to focus a lot more on emerging market currencies, but I would say sort of, you know, speak to him on this or post a discussion there and he can give you a much more informed view than me on Europe, on the euro. I think one very interesting thing uh, from my perspective is that um, over the last few days, uh, Europe has very quietly uh, YCC, which is uh, YCC is a very interesting term. Let me show you what it stands for. Curve control. So it's a, it's a very, very different way to pegging rates. And I think the market's not sort of fully realized this. But if you look at Euro USD, just sort of very briefly, what I find quite interesting is, um, let's look at it on a one year view. So Euro has been quite strong relative to the dollar. If you look at it on a five-year view, actually Euro is you know, quite rich relative to the dollar on a five-year basis, right? So the top is like Euro rich, bottom is you know, Euro weak. So I would say at the margin, you are exposed to negative Euro risk. But having said that, and, and it could weaken, right? I mean, it's expensive here relative to its history. However, it's super easy to hedge it out. You know, um, it costs like almost nothing to short the euro against your position in Cromwell. If, if, if that's what you want to do, if you want to hedge out that risk. Uh, on the other side, if you're looking at, let's say, the Indonesian rupiah and First Street, it's expensive to, to you know, um, short the rupiah because you're, you're exposed to five, six percent carry there on the other side. So I would say a very manageable and hedgeable uh, risk. Okay, um, we've got another question coming in. This is, there have been a few smart karma insights on ESG investing, especially in electric vehicles and clean energy. It seems to me that there's some overlap between these long-term trends and the rotation trend you spoke about today. Do you have any comments on the extent these ideas are complementary over the next few years? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think uh, I think very, very, very sort of briefly uh, addressing this topic. By and large, more and more fund managers are going to be aware and monitor the carbon footprint of their portfolio. So, if they invest in companies that have big carbon footprints, uh, they will be penalized. 
And if they invest in companies that have smaller carbon footprints, it'll be great. Now, you know, you can have tech companies that have very high carbon footprints. I'll give you a great example of that. Bitcoin mining. I mean, Bitcoin mining is a disaster from a climate change perspective, right? Um, but, but, you know, it's supposedly seen as cutting edge tech. Um, so that's actually bad from an ESG standpoint. Meanwhile, you know, you can say that um, com auto companies that still make diesel or petrol engines are bad and electric vehicles are good, but that's not necessarily true either because, you know, EV batteries are, are actually not so great from a carbon footprint perspective. So I think it's very, very nuanced. I think the rotation that we're talking about, just to clarify, uh, these rotations typically last a couple of quarters and they are linked to how people are positioned and where the big underweights are and what the macro situation is. Things like ESG tend to be multi-year in view. And I think that is a much, much longer thematic. Um, I think very briefly put the financials, we mentioned financials and er energy seem to be you know, doing well. Financials suddenly, financials score quite high from an ESG standpoint typically. Uh, energy is of course a mixed bag. I mean, if you're in upstream energy, then it's bad for you. If you're in renewable energy, that's great. So I think, I think it's a bit more nuanced. Hopefully that answers your question. I've got another question here. What is your view of the semiconductor sector? Will it suffer along with other tech? Great topic. It's probably something that we'll speak more about at another session. I will, I will share something interesting though. I mean, if you look at Micron, so they had great results last night. You know, they, they, they were on a Morgan Stanley call after that as well. But look at that, right? So look, Micron ups guidance, revenues up 10, EPS up 17. That's what our analysts wrote, right? But guess what the stock did? Down, you know? Um, so I think tech as a whole is sort of weakening a little bit. I think the longer term positioning in the semiconductor space is very, very interesting. There's this geopolitical tension with China wanting to go self-sufficient. There is, uh, you know, migration to new technology and, and, you know, what Koreans are doing in that space. Uh, and where we are in the cycle is important as well. But again, if you want to look at semiconductor briefly, I think, uh, follow what Jim Handy is saying on the platform and what William Keating is saying. I think Jim uh, especially sort of uh, is quite interesting. He's a semiconductor memory and SSD specialist. And I think uh, he's, he's been talking about the outlook for Semicon very, very closely. I think from a positioning standpoint, I think all of tech, whether it's hardware or down is dangerous, but within all of this, the most dangerous is what's most crowded, and that seems to be NASDAQ tech. And a lot of that is uh, software more than hardware. So hopefully, hopefully that sort of answers the question a little bit. Cool. All right. I think, um, I think um, that was a good discussion for today, guys. Uh, just, just please continue to drop in discussions on the platform, you know, at the bottom of research pieces. You can even tag a particular stock. I'll just maybe briefly show you how to do it. So, you know, just from the dashboard, for example, you can click post and you can type a discussion here. If you are talking about a particular stock, you just use the dollar sign and then type the name. So let's say you have to post a question on Apple. You can just type the name or the ticker. And here you go, Apple, what is the outlook of Services growth, just as an example, and you can hit post. And what this does is it, it, it sends notifications to the relevant analysts who cover Apple, and they can start replying back on some of these things. Hopefully this helps. And well, thank you very much for your time, your questions and participation. You know, um, keep, keep engaging with us and the platform and keep sending in ideas, even for discussions and following forums. And if any of you have missed certain sessions and one recordings, just feel free to write in and we will get those sent over to you. We're happy to share. Thank you very much and have a good week ahead. Bye-bye.